For everybody who's, uh, who's on right now, uh, I just want to welcome you all. And first of all, thank you for taking the time to join us today for episode five of uh, the Road to Success speaker series. Um, I can't tell you how much this means to us. It's something that's really important. At ShopMonkey, we are fortunate enough to work with thousands of amazing customers. And so if you're not familiar with the Road to Success speaker series, I just want to talk a little bit about it because it's rooted in all of those amazing customers we have. And that is this. So many people are doing unique things, taking unique approaches to business, thinking outside of the box, and creating something really special with their businesses, whether it be in the aftermarket, in the general repair, in the tire space, in the heavy duty space, doesn't matter. We're continually hearing about some really great things that shop owners, service writers, and technicians are doing to grow their business, to work in their business, to work on their business, and to make a difference within their communities, as well as with their relationship with their customers. So that being said, one last thing I want to make mention of, uh, as I said before, this is episode five. If you check out shopmonkey.com, you can see all of our previous episodes. Last month, we had a wonderful sit down with Jamie Helm of Wicked Wrench Company, who talked about how culture is impacting her business, the talent that she hires, and the types of customer relationships she has. And she's finding a lot of success in her business. And quite frankly, that's no different uh, than some of the things that Will Helton is doing with University Auto and Tire. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Brett Kinsfather. I'll be today's host for uh, this Road to Success speaker uh, seminar. My guest today is Will Helton, like I said, of University Auto and Tire. Uh, he has quite the background, but more impressive is what he's doing with his current business. So that being said, I'm going to take a step back and Will, do you mind taking it from here and telling us uh, a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, I was really happy to get the um, honor to get the opportunity to present here. I've attended these webinars in the past and gotten a lot out of them and uh, was pretty happy when you guys asked me to kind of give our story. A um, little bit about me. Uh, Graduate from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, Arkansas, Woo Pig, uh, which is really relevant here in this conversation because that's where our business is in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, after I graduated, 16 years with Bridgestone Retail Operations, started out as a store manager, um, ran all uh, all the way up to district manager, region manager, ran all the stores in Texas, Louisiana, opened a bunch of new stores. It was a great great career, great company, and Transitioned over to TBC Corporation, where I was the leader of Midas. I uh, was a division vice president and the vice president general manager of Midas, uh, particularly during COVID, which was a lot of fun um, and a lot of experience. But my always my my burning desire was to do it on my own. Uh, one of my good friends and mentors always said, "If you could do it for them, you could do it for yourself." So you know, here I am, two years later, almost. Uh, owning a, a great business here uh, where we want to live. Um, couldn't do it without my wife, uh, who's my high school sweetheart. She's uh, very much involved in the business as well as our entire family. Um, my oldest son, Jackson, uh, Jimmy, uh, and our dog, Ruby Lou, who is the shop golden retriever, who actually has the highest ticket average. <laughs> it's a little bit about us. Love it. Oh, sorry about that. So, uh, Will, if I may jump in, I just want to kind of give a preview uh, about what's going to be talked about today. I think we want to begin with your philosophy towards business, uh, and then we'll roll into some of the things that you're doing with marketing, uh, and then talk about the processes and the organization that you've put in place. And we can finish things off with a, with a Q&A session. So, if that sounds good to you, and unless there's anything else that you want to interject, we can go ahead and get started. Sure. It's rock and roll. Yeah. All right. So uh, philosophy. Yeah. So um, when we purchased the business, it had been in business. Um, it actually started in 1973. So 50 years. Uh, this, the, the business has been around Fayetteville. It's had a few different ownerships. Um, 
uh, the business model itself was a little cloudy. Um, good location, just wasn't really focused on retail automotive and particularly in just the customer service part of it. And for me in my career, um, I've been blessed to be able to travel really North America um, and see a lot of different owners uh, and how they run their business. And, you know, the one key thing that I always see on successful stores is they have great customer service and people love doing business there. It's really simple as that. Um, so really for me um, and our journey, it started by just having a clear cut vision and mission and building everything around uh, what we do around the, our vision and mission. And it's really just to take care of people. Um, being locally focused, honest, transparent. That's how we operate every day. Um, and taking care of our employees first, um, making sure we have the best talent, giving them the resources. Um, so really, I mean, our vision and mission, I would encourage you if you, uh, if you don't have a vision and mission statement, that would be the, the first step of building a successful business is just kind of having, here's where we, here's where we want to be. And this is what we want to be about. So that's what we do. Well, if, is this, I've got a couple questions around this. So number one, um, your vision and mission, was that something that you already had figured out going in before you purchased this business? Or is that something that you developed as part of that process of planning and opening up? Um, you know, this was part of my original business plan that I pitched to the bank, uh, for funding to get, to buy the place. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we, okay. you know, we, uh, coming from all the years of corporate life and building board decks and, you know, it's kind of like my natural instinct was just to start building a PowerPoint and like, here's what we're going to do. Right. I mean, it's kind of, it's corporified, but uh, for me, it really is uh, important to have that nailed down. And so I spent a lot of time really thinking about this and, and how with trust and transparency um, and growing customer loyalty was going to be our only focus. And, you know, it's kind of the old school leading and lagging indicator, whatever. Yeah, we take care of people. We take care of our employees. We take care of our customers. And, you know, lo and behold, the success comes after that. I see a lot of times when when people focus on short term things like profitability or margins or average work order, we really don't look at that. Ours is our focus is truly around being focused on the customer. So kind of along those lines, your vision and mission actually makes no mention of vehicle repair, tire replacement or anything like that. Did the bank raise any questions when when you were pitching them on this and saying, well, why aren't you talking about those things? Those are numbers and those are important to us. Did you get any uh, pushback on that? Uh, no, they were, they were kind of said the same thing. Uh, just kind of like, well, this is kind of different. You know, um, they, they weren't, uh, they didn't ask too many questions because the way I can articulate it um, and, and being able uh, just as a consumer, right? I mean, right go around, especially the last three or four years with everything that's gone on in the world. It's just, you can never get good customer service, whether it's an automotive repair or, you know, when you're going out to eat dinner and those that mm -hmm. have great customer service dominate the space. And so, you know, you could have one, one, one hamburger place here and one hamburger place there. And the one that beats, you know, does the best with customers is going to be busy. The other one is going to be standing around. So it really resonated to them. Um, it resonated to the employees. The minute that we took over the business, they they got in line really quickly around it, and they, they were they're happy with it. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think a lot of times people want to do well and take care of customers. It's in their nature, and a lot of times companies make it hard for them to do that um, because of some things we'll talk about here uh, later on. So it okay. really just simplifies everybody on on what the mission and vision is. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So my hopes would be that if any of you were to come into uh, our business, you would see our, our mindset and how we operate on a daily basis. And it's really, like I said, uh, you know, taking care of our people, take care of our customers, and then success ultimately follows. You'll see um, urgency and empathy. We talk about that a lot. Um, Pretty much when you call around and ask 
customers will say, you know, how, how long does it wait for me to get my car looked at? And they'll say, well, I'll get to it next week. Or, you know, um, I've had my car there for a week and nobody's called me. Right. People don't honor uh, the, the people's commitments on, on due times. I saw that as a huge opportunity. So we really beat that up on, on urgency uh, and valuing the consumer's time, because that really for us, we don't want to market ourselves as the the lowest price uh, oil change place, and we don't want to uh, race to the bottom. We we want people to come to us when they want the best service possible, and we attract a, a good clientele when we do that. Um, and then the empathetic part, right? So our people are really good when it comes to caring about other people and having empathy for their situation, whether it be if they've got to pick little Johnny up from school, we get them a ride. Um, or we try to make sure that we get the car done in time for mom to pick little Johnny up from school. Um, we hustle and, um, you know, we have a sense of urgency um, to get cars done on a timely basis. Um, when we talk, when we have uh, conversations with our people, meetings, we don't set budgets or goals. Um we don't pay commissions. We don't look at transactions, right? I've seen so many times, you know, an owner of a business come in, just V-line straight to the to the to the hard copies and looking at what the margin was on these, right? And we don't even really ever talk about that. Um, we look at the how many customers have we seen today, how many Google reviews do we have, you know, how, how's the flow going, how's how are the guys in the back doing. Are we making sure that the things keep flowing right? Right. So it's a different perspective, our, our growth mindset. Um, when it comes to hiring, I think that's the most important decision any business owner or manager makes is hiring the right people. Uh, we we hire people that fit our culture, period. Um, and we give those people the best possible resources uh, to be wildly successful. You know, a lot of times companies will um choke out resources or, or allocate capital in different areas. You know, we reinvest our profits to get better, have better equipment, being able to do things better, faster, more efficiently. Um, and that's how we keep and retain and recruit uh, some of the best talent here in the area. Um, I would put our store team up against really any uh, anybody uh, when it comes to being able to execute um, consistently on a daily basis. So, you do those things right at the core, you know, we fix cars, you know, we're not a political organization. We don't get involved in, in anything other than we fix cars right the first time we fix it on time and we do it for a fair price. You know, those are our three underlying traits that we deliver on a daily basis. Um, and it seems to work for us. Well, I have two questions based on what you've shared with us thus far, particularly around this slide. Number one, what percentage of staff has remained and what percentage of staff is new since you took over the business? Um, we've added our head count dramatically, especially in the back. Um, there were there were a couple people, nobody's really left. Uh, there's been a couple that didn't quite meet our standard uh, that we brought new folks in and we have a hundred percent retainment. So, you know, our, our right. team, we, we haven't, we haven't had turnover at all. We just have continued to add more and more people on. Um, and we've had a lot of success too um, with uh, because the university is right here, right? We've had, we have an, I have a 19 year old that works here who I think is an absolute stud. You know, he's smart. He works his ass off. Um, so it kind of dispels the whole rumor about the next generation, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, and I think that we do a lot here as far as from a culture perspective to um, have that urgency, that empathy. And, and people want to work in an environment that's hopping. Right. They don't want to they don't want to work in a stale environment. So we, we've had a lot of success recruiting and retaining uh, our talent. Got it. One last question that I have is. How do you communicate and and teach that growth mindset to your entire staff so there's really consistent buy-in by everybody? Yeah, well, at first, right? So um, when we first purchased the business, um, the manager and one of the salespeople, we did not retain. 
Uh, so it was basically, I, I, we bought it and, and I was here with the, the, the mainstay, um, associate that had been here for a long time. So we went all the way down. Right. And then we built it back up. And so now when you bring people in, right, we change the culture, you bring somebody in, they, people are going to naturally adhere to whatever the vibe is and the business that they're at. Right. If it's okay to come in an hour late, somebody that starts, they're going to come in on time, but then eventually they're going to start coming in late too, because everybody does it. Right. So it's one of those things that self teaches. Once you set the tone, get the right, the right people in the boat with you. Uh, when you add components, they just naturally adhere to it. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've been a part of millions of discussions where people talk and I've always thought to myself, like, all right, so how's this guy really doing? So I thought maybe we should just throw some of this up. Um, and, you know, so we purchased it in the beginning of 2022, actually December of 21. Um, so you can see where we've doubled our customer count year one. Uh, this year, we're on pace for 4,500 customers, which is still uh, not where we want to be, uh, but the growth is uh, is really coming from the customer count growth. Um, I've seen a lot of businesses scratch their heads on, you know, why are sales not growing? Uh, well, if your customer counts flat or going down, you're totally relying on your average work order, which is not the way customers <laughs> want to do business, right? You, you, you can't survive long term. Um, on a handful of customers a day, you got to grow your customers. So really our strategy was twofold. One was get our process right um, and staffing right to be able to, to take on more cars uh, and then do um, get into the tire business, um, which we think is really, really critical to our long-term growth as vehicles evolve as well. So you can see where our growth is coming from. Um, and then the service comes naturally. Um, if you have more cars, more tires, more opportunities. If you do quality inspections, take care of customers, you know, you're going to see the results trickle to the bottom line uh, versus the reverse order where people always want to know like what, what we're going to hit here and here. Well, you know, we look at the, the, the customer count and the opportunities and the loyalty. That's the only thing we focus on. Okay. Awesome. You want to run through your four P's? Yeah. So, um, when I was asked to do this, kind of look at, uh, to, to look at, hey, hey, how can you duplicate this? What are some things that people need to know uh, that are either own a store or beginning to own a shop or struggling? Um, really with us, uh, it goes back to some basic business fundamentals, the four Ps, uh, people, um, which is number one, right? In our business, it's, I call it the capacity to say yes. You know, if you've got two techs in the back, you're never going to get to 30 cars a day. Um, so you got to fuel the fire. You got to have the right staff. You got to have the right people. Second is process. Um, flow is the higher volume, right? So always look at the analogy of McDonald's, right? So I mean, you when you go to McDonald's and you have to take take your order, they hit the button, the little burger slides down, the guy's there with the padding, you get squirt, squirt, boom, it's down the chute, right? That's the process. If McDonald's just had a big charcoal grill sitting out in the middle of the kitchen and some hamburgers and patties kind of hanging out, right? You would get one burger would be that thick. One burger would be that thick, right? It would be inconsistent and inefficient. So process is huge for me um, in being able to grow your volume. Um, product is the next one, right? So you got to be clear in what you do. I've always been a fan of of restaurants again, like ones that sell barbecue, tacos, spaghetti. Uh, they're probably not good at anything, but the one place that just sells street tacos, they're banging, right? So simplify what you do, do it really, really well, um, and be clear in what you do. And the, the fourth is promotion, right? So once you have your people process your product, then your promotion, right? So promotion in a lot of people's eyes is just What's the offer? What what dollar ninety nine are we going to run oil changes on? Right, promotion is not anything to do with that. Promotion is your brand experience throughout the marketing funnel, which we'll get to here in a second. So, the four P's. If you're missing one of those, uh, 
need to get those addressed. All right, excellent. We'll go ahead and move to the marketing funnel. Uh, I want to let you know we did get a question in. Uh, happy to save that for the end if that's better for you from a flow standpoint, uh, or if you'd like to take a moment to answer a question about um, uh, payment and, and hours and things like that. Um, we can do it at the end. Okay, sounds good. Very <clears throat> good. All right, let's keep going on to marketing. Yeah. So again, my, my challenge here was just growing customer count. And, you know, once you get the foundation right with the people and the process and the, and the product, how do you pull people through your funnel? Um, and so uh, I learned this from um, a prior life, um, the conversion funnel. So you got brand awareness, you've got consideration to come see you, you've got the conversion and you got loyalty and then you create brand advocates. And so the little um, bullet points out to the side are all the different tentacles that we look at. Uh, I look at on a constant basis to make sure that they're right. Um, consider the funnel kind of like a slide, right? You don't want any sticking points on it. You want it to flow nice and easy. So top of the funnel stuff, um, we had a lot of success which was against uh, a lot of, uh, initially I was kind of hesitant, but news stories. We had the local news company um, contact us about a story about um, uh, EVs. And so we did a story on that and then they wanted to do a story on hot weather, then ice storms. Now it seems like the local news station, anytime there's anything to do with cars, they come see us. We, we invite them in and, and we, do, we, we give them great content. Little that I know at the time that that was going to be a big, um, a big deal for us. A lot of people saw that and didn't even know that we existed. It's kind of pans into social media, right? So social media, we try to do a good job of just representing our brand appropriately uh, and making sure that people see who we really are. Um, our customer reviews, we really, really make sure. Uh, that that is monitored and responded to instantly and that we're driving that uh, because usually that's the first time people will experience your brand is they'll check your Google out. Um, referrals are huge for us. We manage our website and how that's used. We'll get to that. Um, some direct mail pieces we'll talk about. And then it gets into consideration. That's your incoming phone calls. That's your Google interactions. That's how many appointments you schedule. Um, when they show up to your store, how is your image? Uh, when you do a quality digital vehicle inspection, estimates are prioritized. You get the car done right. It's fixed right. Boom. Then you create advocate customers, people they are going to go and tell their friends like, yes, University Auto and Tire, that's where you need to go. So as you look at your business, once you, once you hone in your funnel, um, you can pull customers through that funnel and win them over as brand ambassadors. So um, step one, eliminate the bottlenecks. Step two, feed the funnel. Step three, just grow like hell, right? Uh, it's pretty It's pretty simple. At a high level, that's what we've done uh, to grow. Awesome. So you talked uh, about your Google reviews. Uh, we've got a slide here on that if you want to dive in. Yeah, so I see a lot of shops that that – that, um, you know, we're obviously looking around to looking for acquisitions. And um, the first thing I always do is, is, is look at their Google, um, because usually that's where the customer is going to engage you first. And uh, it's really important to me, your brand should be reflected online. Uh, we get a lot of times customers will come in and, you know, you get a picture of your store and it's actually your store, right? It's not some fake picture or a picture of a car or a picture of a tire, right? Um, you can manage your Google, you can get ownership of it, and you can create a really simple and slick Google profile to where it reflects your brand accurately. To me, the worst thing is when somebody sees, oh, look at this nice place and they come in and it's a dump, right? Not only, not only uh, are you lying to your customers, but you're probably alienating them too, right? They're gonna, they're gonna wanna leave immediately. So making sure that your, your brand is reflected there, that you're driving Google scores. Um, you know, our quest is, is to push 500 plus. Um, we're, we're chugging along pretty well. Uh, but if you're less than 100 Google reviews, you're really not a vibrant 
business on Google. There's a lot of resources that you can look at um, and how to manage your Google. I would highly encourage you to do that. That's been a big win for us is to get our Google right. Uh, Will, is this something that you've done entirely in a house or did you uh, receive third party assistance with, with getting your Google set up right to help navigate that? <clears throat> we did our Google entirely in house. Okay. Um, we have uh, uh, a, 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 an agency that does our website um, and built some of the, the back end, some of the descriptions in the website that link into the Google analytics. But, you know, we took ownership of our Google page and we uh, monitor it in house exclusively. I think ownership is the key word there. It's clearly important to you guys and, and your business. It's the number one, uh, the first place that your customers are going to engage you in. Yeah. Excellent. So you mentioned website, having a third party that works with you on this. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, website building was a little bit out of my um, ballpark. So uh, one of our good friends that owns an ad agency built our website, uh, did a phenomenal job with that. And one of the things that we do uh, is we're constantly looking at, at where our customers, like what do they care about and what are they clicking on? Um, and what's our website traffic? Um, so I would encourage you, if you have a website, a lot of times, um, you know, people will try to get you on some cookie cutter websites. I know a lot of the parts vendors have programs where they'll build, build one. It's really for us, a, a, a huge weapon to understand how our customers act. So if you don't have access to data for your specific website, I would highly encourage you to do that because it really gives you a lot of good information on do you know your peaks and valleys and do people actually care um, about your business? Yeah, and I think just looking at this heat map, um, you know, you talked about you added tires to your business and you see it as a big part of ongoing growth. Just looking at the website, there's a ton of traffic equal to, if not more than what people are clicking on the auto repair services for. Right. Yes. So it and validates that, that sort of uh, investment or that business plan of growth. Yeah. I mean, it, to, to me, to be relevant in the 21st century, you've got to be able to sell tires. I mean, nobody goes to um, McDonald's for a Big Mac, Wendy's for a Frosty and Burger King for the fries, right? They want to go to one place. Uh, we want to do everything. And that's part of our, of our vision as well as people think about something with their car. They want, I want them to call us. Even if we don't do it, we know somebody that can, we'll outsource it. We'll set it up for them, but we want to be top of mind. Anytime any of our customers even think about an issue with their car. Yeah. And so this is our, um, we also pull analytics from our website on just overall traffic um, so we heat map where they're clicking and then we look at traffic. We look and see, um, the lift, right? So if we do a promotion, a direct mail piece, boom, we can see, boom, there's that, that moved the needle. Or if we do, um, you know, a TV commercial and it just kind of, uh, right. So we know, okay, let's not spend money on that. All right. So we look and see where we're getting lift truly from a website traffic um, and then that's, again, that's the consideration portion. When you go to the next slide, we can see, um, uh, so there's another one, right? So um, direct mail pieces. So we can see when that direct mail piece hit the mailboxes. Um, I use a company called Upswell. Uh, highly recommend using them. They've got great data. They're able to just pinpoint towards uh, postal routes. So I can just exactly precision uh, precisely place pieces in people's mailboxes that I want. And I can see the impact when they go to the website and I can see um, on the next slide, I can see their, their digital calls. So we own five phone numbers here. Uh, we own them and we use them on these digital market, on these marketing pieces. Um, you know, now I don't, I'm, I'm a big believer in owning your phone number and not having another marketing agency or somebody else own that uh, because if I'm going to spend money to put that number out there, I want it to be mine. So we have unique numbers that we own 
So I can see on this piece, for example, boom, how many people called in on that one unique number um, through our, our phone. So that was the other thing that we did. We converted our phones, which were just your basic landline phones into digital phones. Um, is that that's something that Upswell worked with you on, or is that something that you guys investigated and completed on your own? That was something that we did. Um, okay. Yes. Um, I've seen this in the past. I've seen companies that sell, um, you know, um, they sell uh, that product and as a marketing tool. But for us, I just thought, well, let's just convert all of them. Because in a lot of cases, um, organizations will look at your your incoming phone calls, but that's only on a certain sliver of numbers, like your Google number. You can see how many people are calling you on Google, but that's just how many are clicking you on Google. I want to see any time that the phone rings in this building, who called and all that information. So for us, it really just opened up like all that you can see and to be able to truly gauge the return on investment on every dollar that we spend on marketing because marketing can be a huge expense. And to me, it should work. It should put a car in the bay or make an impact. Right. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a big investment for us. And, and, and we want to make sure that it has a great, great return. Will, when it comes to direct mail, what sort of time frame do you measure after something is sent uh, to to determine its effectiveness? And similarly with uh, the website, how what sort of frequency are you checking that data on and and drawing comparisons or drawing conclusions from? Yes, we we just strategically place our our marketing investments when we know we're going to be on a slower period of time. Uh, when demand drops. So um, it's planned out. And mm-hmm. so we know when we're going to hit it. And then we we measure the lift uh, on a weekly basis. Um, okay. I know exactly when, like, for example, the direct mail pieces, we, we know that it's going to hit on Friday, Saturday, or uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We do it on payday weekends, right? So we do it on weeks where uh, if your salary or, or paid uh, weekly, everybody's getting a check that week, right? So mm-hmm. uh, it's going to hit the end of that week. So I know everybody's getting paid on Friday. Everybody's got a piece from me on that weekend. And then, you know, uh, we have a ticket bag right by the front counter. So anytime somebody comes in, my guys write the, the work order number on it. They stick it in an envelope. So I can go back and pull all those pieces out and I see, boom, boom, boom. All right. Which ones worked, which ones didn't work. And, um, and usually for us, um, customers love it because, um, you know, every little bit helps, especially in this day and age. And so we've actually gotten a lot of customer acquisition just with, uh, some basic offers and some tire rebates, uh, that are well-placed. So it's been, it's been a good one for us. Awesome. I think that's brilliant. I want to just reiterate uh, something I heard you say is, you know, when it comes to marketing pieces, it's so, it's so common for people want to get stuff out just right away as quickly as possible, but you're timing it around paydays. And for particularly for consumers, I think that that's incredibly important. Absolutely. Yeah. So a little bit more about the phones. I kind of jumped the gun on that one, but Yeah, always own your phone number. Um, and then every incoming call is an opportunity to convert, right? People don't call your shop just for the hell of it. They call because there's something going on. And so then that goes directly into two key insights for us is staffing and um, um, making sure that we've got the proper headcount, making sure that we're right. So you can see our average call volume. This was in... Um, Second quarter, uh, we're over 60 or uh, 80 calls, right around 80 calls a day, um, one day over 110. So you can see our call volume there. Um, and I can see, you know, Mondays, I get more calls than I do on Wednesdays. So then if somebody's got to have a day off, I schedule them off on Wednesday. I don't schedule them off on Monday. I don't schedule people off on Fridays. So you can really get a lot of staffing insights from that. And then also, um, 
we had a challenge. We're only open half a day on Saturday, and it's really just to take care of customers in an emergency situation. But the store was doing little to no business on Monday, or on, I'm sorry, on Saturday. So we started scheduling appointments and kind of deferring demand off. So if somebody calls in and we're slams, hey, how about coming in Saturday morning for those tires? Sure, no problem. And so then it's helped them out. It's helped us out. It's leveled out um, a little bit of the demand so where we can be more productive and take in more customers. Great points. You know, uh, I'm really big on on image as well. Well, I think that, um, you know, uh, your first impression is huge. Um, so when people see your Google page or if they see your website, when they pull in the parking lot, it should be reflected in that. Uh, when they walk in the door, they should see that and should, you should look like a place where people want to do business. I see so many shops. It's just, it's exhausting to see how many shops just don't look good from the curb. People drive by and just take a glance and it depending on what kind of customer you're going for. For us, we we're looking for, uh, we're looking for a certain demographic, right? We don't, we're not trying to do $9 oil changes and $20 break jobs. There's somebody down the road that does that. And I, Good luck to them. Uh, For us, we want the right customer. We want the right demographic. And so, um, and to our legacy customers that have been coming here for a long time, I I can't tell you how many times we get people tell us, um, thank you all for, for, um, for reinvesting in this brand. This, this shop's been here forever and it looks vibrant. Uh, It looks like things are going on. And so, um, which is not all us. It's uh, it's our people and even uh, previous ownership. Um, but for for us, we really take it um, our brand, our curb appeal to the highest level. Making sure our parking lot, our our, our grass is in order. Uh, to me, I think it's an important part of the branding process. Well, I w- I would agree with you, and I think it there's a strong correlation, and it translates directly into. Um, the consumer's trust when it comes down to your uh, recommendations of what work needs to be done and things like that. Like you said before, if somebody walks in or somebody pulls in and the image of your actual shop is significantly different from what they saw online, well, what does that tell them about how you do business, how you communicate, what you're trying to, uh, do you just want to get them there and then you can tell them whatever you think is necessary? Um, I, I think it's a really, really strong correlation that you're that you're calling out here. Cool. So, ready to talk about organization and processes? Yeah. So, to me, this is a this is really rocket fuel um, to make sure that you're able to to flow right, right, and honor due times and fix cars right the first time. Really, um, you know. When shops aren't organized and it's a cluster, you know what, right? You got poor customer experience, upset employees, you're not maximizing growth, you have margin erosion, theft issues. So being organized and having a strong process is the most important part of taking it to the next level once you get the staffing correct. So just a couple of pictures of what this looks like. So uh, this is to the left is before uh, these are all before like when I when I first took over their ticket distribution had opportunities right they just had tickets they used um, RO um, RO writer printed off the the hard copy put the key on it and so the guys could just grab whatever ticket they didn't they didn't know what was due at noon they had no idea you know if this car was a comeback or a priority or if this was the mayor of Fayetteville's car Right. They didn't know, you know, and so uh, you lose a little bit there. And then just organization, um, having bills everywhere and paperwork piled up. There's no way to have um, accuracy in any of your margins if you're paying bills at, off of your statement. Right. So you have to have organization uh, to turn things around. So that was one of the first things that we did. And I would say, um even though uh, Shop Monkey, you know, um, 
is putting this on. I don't, I'm not getting anything to say this. Shop Monkey was a huge part of this uh, to integrate in with Shop Monkey and how they're organized. I'm a huge fan of, and it's been a, a big part of our success. So we um, we organize things around our, our our Shop Monkey, our workflow, our ticket distribution when tickets are invoiced, when contact the customer, say, hey, Brett, your car's ready to go. You know, Shop Monkey cuts down a lot of time where you're on the phone doing that to just click a button and message them. And we're very process oriented. We know what cars do next. We know what cars are going to be done today. When a customer contacts us and say, hey, have you looked at our car? We don't have to um, wonder or go run around the shop and ask three people. Like, we know what's going on. And it really helps with our process there. Oh, that's great. The other part, just oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say the. Um, I actually appreciate the labeling there because it's just one of those things where, um, if somebody's new or if somebody is, you know, whatever, uh, just that speed and efficiency of knowing exactly where to go exactly where to find stuff and i'm not even talking about the digital component i'm just talking about the physical component um while the countertop was clean in the before picture um you talked about how even though it's there it's laid out it's still very disorganized and just by even the simple rearrangement and the proper labeling has to make it has to make a big difference as well which anybody yeah. can do Oh, it's very simple. It's very simple yeah. to, to, and there's a, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, it's just, it's just, I would just say, make sure, especially if you have more than one stores, the key of process is if you can take one person in store A and put them in store B and they, and it's the same process, right? Then, you know, you've got it down um, and it works. Yeah. So this was our service manager area here, which was just a collection of returns. You know, there's expensive dealer parts laying around that hadn't been returned. Uh, it's kind of like the land of misfit toys, right? And then the techs, they had this little computer there and that they were kind of pulling up things from Identifix and trying to figure things out. And so for us, next slide, we really transitioned this into a, a workstation, right? So um, we have... I don't even know how many computers here. Everybody has, there's computers everywhere. Um, we have, um, ac the techs have access to the data that they need to fix cars. Uh, we have a pretty good sized building. So we have, they have laptops back in the back that can pull up all the schematics and stuff that they need without having to walk back and forth all day and take up time. We've got oil change um sticker the label makers that that shop monkey does and, and it's very professional we've got those everywhere uh, we're efficient with our parts returns you know you can always tell with my experience stores that um are organized if you could um the parts return and the parts shelf is there's like four or five parts on it right at, at, and during the middle of the day there's a ton of parts on it but at the end of the day there's like three because they're all they're all in cars now uh, but you can see a disorganized shop because there's a pile of parts in the corner where you can build a car from scratch, basically <laughs> off of returns. And, you know, nobody really likes that. People, the, the, the guys in the back, they want to make they want to make hours. So they want their parts there. They want to be able to get it done. They want to keep moving. Um, awesome. And so being organized is important for that. Very cool. Appointments is something too that I've seen so many from a culture perspective, so many stores, they don't take appointments. It's first come first serve. That is the worst mentality to have. Your customers demand appointments. You know, if you're going to be omni-channel, which we are, our, our, our big goal is to be omni-channel, to be able to click and buy and be able to have our mobile unit come to your house, be able to have our brick and mortar store here. Right. So appointments are a key driving force of of, of our organization and growth. Um, every morning we come in, there's at least 15 to 20 appointments for the day. Um, and the keys are in the drop box and the cars are out front. And we spend about 10 minutes just, you know, getting things. All right, here we go. And we're, we're off to the races. So then 
when we have appointments and we're, we've got the parts, we can get them done faster and we can take walk-ins. And, and a lot of times people are shocked because they, there's nowhere to park. Um, cause we're so, we're so full, but somebody will just kind of park and come in double park and say, Hey, can you guys get me in for a flat repair? And we're like, yeah, give me your keys. We'll get it right now. And they're shocked. Right. Because we can, because we're, 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 we're set up and we're organized. So if you don't do appointments, you should do appointments. Awesome points. And we've spent, um, uh, a big amount of money, uh, on equipment upgrades. Shout out to Hunter, um, Hunter equipment. Um, I think it's the best period. We have bought the revolution tire machine, which is the autonomous tire mounting machine. So, um, we're not scared. We had a, um, uh, eight series BMW in here with a 20 inch tire, low profile run flats and did it like that. You know, um, being able to have the proper equipment, uh, we have the fully integrated alignment rack, so it's very efficient. It's the big rack, so we can take on big commercial accounts as well. Um, and then the, uh, Hunter on car lathe. Uh, with all of the digital stuff attached, it's a pretty expensive piece of equipment, but man, it has been a, a big savior for us when it comes to quality brake jobs. You know, a lot of times people will just replace rotors um, and really, you know, a, a lot of people just, they just replace rotors on every brake job. Um, I don't really want to do that. I want to, I want to cut the rotor and do a better brake job and, and uh, have the customer, our price on our brake job is, better because we're not spending money on, on, on steel. Um, the customer's not spending their money on steel. So they get a better break job for a lower price and we can get it done quickly. So, um, I would encourage you to upgrade your equipment. Um, if you haven't already. Awesome. And real quick, one, one quick question, cause I want to make sure we have time for a couple questions we have, but when it comes to, when you invest in that new equipment, what does that do for your marketing? Like, are you turning that on as quickly as possible? Do you have stuff planned for when it arrives and you're offering new services? How are you getting that information out to the local community? Yeah, we use a lot on our so on our social media, which you feel free to check out. Um, we we brag about our equipment, which does two things. Um, it lets our customers see like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Um, and then um, people in, in our industry look and people want to come work for a shop that's got the cool stuff, you know, so it helps with your retention as well. Um, but yeah, we market it. We show it off all the time. It, it, all of our posts are pretty much uh, feature our guys working with our cool stuff. We've got all of the cool uh, gadgets, <laughs> you know, so um, good. yeah, I think it's an, an important part of our success as well. And then this, um, this is our mobile tire shop. So we got into the mobile tire game uh, at the end of last year and it's been ramping up and we market that pretty heavily as well. And people are shocked here in Northwest Arkansas. It's not a service that's been available um, versus the bigger cities that have had this with different companies. Um, and so people, you know, the mobile tire installs that actually happen yeah, that's good. But for us, it's more of a branding thing. So people look at us as a progressive, uh, you know, uh, wow, wow. These guys really have all the, 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 the technology to work on my Audi. Right. So we get a higher demographic without even touching their, their, their tires at their house, which we could. Right. Um, so just kind of shows again, brand investments, and for us, our mobile tire unit is in-house. It's not a third party. It's us. So when you call that number, it's the store's number, uh, which really helps get everybody on the same page and really help build that business as well. Uh, we are up on time. So even though, but I did start five minutes late, just allowing people to join. Will, is there anything else that you wanted, any parting words or anything that you wanted to um uh, say before we, we close out today? Um, not really. I think uh, it's been a great conversation. I think just keeping it simple, focusing on the basics, don't get too greedy, um, have some fun as a recipe for success uh, for us. So um, 
I enjoyed the time here today and, and hope that uh, everybody got a little something out of it. Yeah, thank you very much. One, one thing I want to say is I've heard a number of presentations from owners, coaches, technicians, a variety of people. And uh, it, it's always interesting to me how what I hear a lot of is measure, 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 track your data. But oftentimes I've heard people making that suggestion. Some of the things that you were saying that you don't track. All, all of the little details when you're keeping a clear focus on growth, whereas everybody else seems to be tracking costs, or I come across that a lot, to be fair in my statement. And so I thought that was really important to think about in how um, you can use the same tools that you might use to look at one type of data. But when you look at another type of data, in your case, growth-based data, uh, I think that's pretty interesting. I think it can help give people a completely different view and understanding of their business. So thanks for sharing all that. I really do appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. Appreciate you all. all. Right. Yes. And so thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, and uh, if you want to see this again or pick up something that you might have missed, uh, we'll have this recording out shortly on our website and pushing through social media. So thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Thank you.